before we go round the back of the organ to have a look at some of the um, components on the component shelf, um, I was thinking that I'd like to uh, show you what is inside the control console here. Um, but that would be rather tedious because I would have to start unscrewing wood screws uh, to take off the panels before you'd be able to see anything reasonable. So what I'm going to do instead is I've got a, a, um, a, a photograph here which you can't see in detail as we look at it at the moment but I will put a, um, a picture of this up on the screen whilst I talk. Um, this uh, picture is uh, actually upside down for a very simple reason um, that it's taken from below. Um, so essentially the lower panel, bottom panel of the enclosure for the uh, control console has been removed and this allows us to see all the contents. It's pretty empty actually but if I go over the key parts, um, if you look over to the left you'll see where the mains section is and uh, at the top of that you'll be able to see the two rectangular mains rocker switches. Um, now of course they, they appear at the top because this picture is upside down. You can also see in the very far bottom far left corner as you're looking at it you can see a circular thing that in fact is the key switch at the bottom that again is in the top uh, corner uh, when the thing is orientated correctly. Um, by the side of that uh, is the button for the lit uh, control that turns the computer off. Um, incidentally that control doesn't turn the computer on, it only turns it off. Then if we move um, a little bit further uh, this way, move from there to there and look at these areas here, you can see the four switches, one of them is concealed, but you can see the four switches, one of which um, selects whether you're dealing with organs, combination sets or temperaments. Um, that's the one on the far left as you're looking at it. In the middle of the very visible three um, is, the, is the, the previous and then you've got the next and then um, just in view, hardly in view at all, you can see the load button which allows you to load whichever item you've currently got queued. Okay, the other uh, very significant thing that you can see is across the centre here, across there, and that is the um, the printed circuit board for the 16 lit rocker tabs that constitute most of the couplers on the organ. Um, then as we move further across you see another set of switches here on the far right. If we turn that correctly, the correct way up, it should be like that, that's how it's orientated, but um, because as I mentioned I've had to take this picture from underneath, um, we can see here um, the six uh, control switches which deal with the um, registration steppers and then the um, uh, just to the right of that there is a column of three which are concerned with audio and MIDI recording and turning recording off and then uh, right at the far end here, on the right of this picture, but um, inverted when it's orientated correctly, you can see the um, volume control for the uh, audio through the headphones and the socket for the stereo headphones. Now, those are all the switches and things that are on there, but, but well, how does it all work? Well, first of all, if I turn your attention here, this component here, this is the small circuit board, and it is small, um, which con constitutes the PJRC Teensy 4.1. And it's mounted on the support board so that we've got um, uh, some 50 way um, installation displacement connectors for ribbon cable, one on one side of the Teensy and the other on the other side. And the one on the, on your left as you're looking at it actually um, delivers the switching and the LEDs for the components that are on your left and the uh, connector on the right 
that connects this great big ribbon cable here, which is 50 ways. It goes all the way across the um, uh, the control console. I'll show you here. This is the ribbon cable that we're talking about, and it goes all the way across and ends up on another connection board, which enables us to separate all the connections to the switches and the controls that are on the right-hand side as you're looking. And you can also see beneath that there is a grey ribbon cable, I'll point this out to you here, and that grey ribbon cable carries on all the way through and goes to um, this end of the thing where the display is situated. Uh, it's behind the ribbon cable at that point, you can't properly see it, but um, you can uh, see the one on this side um, because it's underneath here, uh, and this uh, grey ribbon cable delivers all the data signals which enable the uh, text displays to work on the TFT, colour TFT displays. So that's the, um, uh, the, the insides of the control console um, and uh, I hope that uh, kind of just illuminates a little bit about what's inside it and maybe a bit of how it's all working. Thank you. We've come around the back of the organ um, because uh, we're going to have a look inside the uh, main console uh, at the component shelf and the things that are on it and we're also going to have a quick peep inside the stop jams as well. I've uh, removed the back from the organ and we're now looking inside it uh, having removed um, back panels um, I want you to just observe two or three things. You can see there a little wooden box that contains the Arduino Nano which drives the pedal board and the two expression pedals and we can see the cable here which comes from the pedal board and we can see the two um, cables that come in from the uh, expression pedals. There's one and there's the other. And then above that, if you look carefully, you can see that I have got a strip board going along here. And this carries the LEDs for the three right hand um, uh, tow pistons. And the tow piston switches and their wiring are all visible there. So this is in the lower part of the rear of the organ. And that is on the right hand side as seen from the bench. So let's have a look and see what's visible on the left. This is um, what we can see inside the bottom of the console uh, on the left hand side of the console as viewed from the bench. The only thing really that there is to see which you may be able to pick out is a similar strip board with connections to the three toe pistons. And both of these two strip boards, the one on the right and the one on the left, carry cable, um, have cable connections into the um, stop jams. So there is a cable connection here which will connect, which connects up into the left hand stop jam. Likewise there's a similar cable on the uh, other side which connects into the right hand stop jam. We're now looking into the left hand side of the uh, back of the console as would be from the uh, organ bench which is the right hand side of course when we look at it from behind. Just um, notice that um, the, the design of this is very similar to the way we designed Opus 1 in that we have what I've called the component shelf which holds the key components of the organ and so can therefore accommodate the interconnections uh, very reasonably, it's a reasonable way of doing it. Just to point out what we're looking at at the moment, the two principal components that we can see are here, which is the power supply to the PC, and here, which is the PC itself. Now it's worth saying a word or two about the PC, um, because uh, you'll notice how small it is. It is only paperback book size. And this is an Intel Skull Canyon, known as an NUC machine. Um, 
it's very, very small. The one disadvantage of it being small is that um, the processor is soldered in. Uh, it's not on a socket. So if the processor should fail, you are utterly stuck. Um, that's the one disadvantage. But the advantage is it's very fast and it's very powerful. It's a little expensive, but um, it's probably worth it. Now it's running Windows 10. Um, it has an i7 processor um, and uh, it has, um, when, it, when it arrives, it has no memory and no disk space, so you have to install those yourself. The maximum it can take is what is actually installed in this machine, which is 32 gigabytes of fast RAM. And it's also got two slots for SSD, um, uh, solid state disk drives. And it's got two, they're both filled, two slots, both filled with two terabyte um, SSD disks, so four terabytes in all. Um, the idea being that there is a backup uh, readily available because um, SSDs, uh, uh, solid state um, disks, do have a technical issue in the kind of uh, gates that they use, um, the, the way it's built in NAND technology. It has a limited number of writes um, for, for each memory cell, each bit. Um, now fortunately in Hauptwerk uh, it's a fairly static situation. Once you've installed your sample sets and you've cached them, the, the machine stays pretty well as it is. So it shouldn't be a problem with, um, with a Hauptwerk application. This um, PC has got enough USB slots to um, provide the basics, but you will see that um, in my installation I've got so many USB devices, and, I, and you'll come up to those in a minute, um, that we actually have to have um, uh, two USB powered hubs. So actually we have, um, you can see here, that we have uh, two USB connections there and you can read that they are to USB hubs and then we also have two more around the front here and they're 3.1 uh, USB devices so they are they're fast although actually USB 2 is quite adequate for most of this even though how it work is very demanding so there we have the PC and its power supply what we're going to do now is to move on a little and look at the central section. Now we're looking at the central section of the um, component shelf and uh, next to the PC, so you can get your bearings, there's the PC that we looked at a moment ago. Next to the PC is this Cymatic Audio device which is um, a 16 channel audio interface. It connects via USB um, you can see the connections here for the 16 channels. We are only using uh, eight of them. Um, uh, so you, you, you could have 16 uh, independent speaker channels if you so wished. Um, it is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a USB device. It works. It's very economically priced, uh, but it does have the slight disadvantage that when the um, system is first turned on, it's very prone to creating a lot of um, uh, crackles and uh, pops from the loudspeakers as the system boots up. However, once that's happened, uh, it's, um, it, it seems to be fine. Um, it's an ASIO compatible uh, device, so uh, it's got very, very minimal latency. And at the price, it's very good. I do actually have two other interfaces, Opus 1, um, I still have the PC from Opus 1, and the PC in Opus 1 had a, a Delta 1010, which is an M audio device, 1010 LT, which had eight uh, audio channels, and it, ha it, it could have ten, because it also had a, uh, an, an output through a um, jack socket, um, as well as the, uh, the uh, output through its RCA phono sockets. Um, uh, that was very good, but that of course was an internal device. And then I have another external device, which is a Behringer UM uh, uh, 18, I think it is, 
um, and I haven't yet had an opportunity to try that uh, but um, that's much much larger and would be difficult to accommodate in this particular instrument so I haven't used it as yet. Now let's um, just move further to this side so I'm going to show you now what we've got here you can see it says two times USB hubs these are powered hubs um, and they're actually USB 2 they're not USB 3 and that's deliberate um, there was in USB 3.0 there was a bug in the firmware on most motherboards that drove the USB 3.0 um, hubs USB hubs uh, and that uh, sometimes led to issues when you used a USB 2 or certain other types of USB device uh, in those hubs. So right at the beginning I thought I'm going to, for certain things, I'm going to avoid uh, USB 3 if I can. So these are USB 2 hubs. There are absolutely no issues uh, with using, as far as I can see, using USB 2 with Houtberg. I mean, I have got the Estegom organ, which is massive, and because it's got a 12-second reverberation time, um, its polyphony issues are right up to the fore. If you're going to experience them, you will with that organ. Uh, and, um, of course, the speed of the USB and the responsiveness of the organ overall is, is dependent on uh, everything um, working without any latency. There's no evidence of latency or polyph polyphony issues with that very large organ. So I'm very content to consider that that is not an, an issue. Um, these are uh, seven, port, seven port hubs um, and uh, quite a few of them as you can see are, are occupied but they're powered as well which is advantageous um, because uh, you need to limit the power drawn from the uh, motherboard of the host PC. Um, Shortly, just in a few seconds, I will move us along and we will have a look at the final item on the very far right of the component shelf. We're now looking uh, at the last of the items on the component shelf. and This is in the far, on the far right side as viewed from the bench. Obviously, when viewed from behind the organ as we're looking at the moment, it's on the left. And this is a TAPCO 4x4 uh, MIDI hub and uh, being 4x4 four four, it's got four inputs and four outputs um, and uh, these um, uh, devices uh, the, uh, the devices which connect to this um, uh, MIDI hub um, are the uh, pedal board and its associated expression pedals and the left stop jam both for encoding and decoding and the right stop jam likewise for encoding and decoding. Of course the um, uh, pedal board um, uh, uh, and the expression pedals are uh, input only as far as the MIDI hub is concerned. They only provide outputs, of course, to go into the input of the MIDI hub. There's no associated output with that. So that's the um, TAPCO 4x4. And if you look at it, you can see there's a green light flashing. Actually, there are two green lights flashing, but um, the top one's not visible to you because it's being obscured uh, by the handle, carrying handle, one of the carrying handles of the uh, MIDI hub. Now, um, this is one of the annoying features of the encoders that we've used in the stop jams. Um, we've used Orgal Matek, which have a price advantage, but I really do wish that we could turn off auto sensing, because as far as I'm concerned, when you've got a very heavily loaded MIDI bus, it seems to be um, unnecessary to have auto sensing uh, making it even more heavily loaded but uh, there is no way of turning this off uh, from the encoding MIDI PCBs in the stop jams. We're going to have a look at the stop jams in a minute anyway. But there we are um, that's the um, all of the components now that you've seen on the component shelf uh, and uh, they're all fixed down and wired together uh, and that's a stable arrangement. So we're going to look at the stop jams right in a moment. OK, we're now looking straight into the right hand stop jam as seen from the bench, on the left when seen from behind. 
Uh, it's very difficult for you to discern many of the details uh, in this jam. We will have a look at the left-hand stop jam in a moment, which is a little easier to see. But uh, the things that I'd like to point out to you, first of all, let's just zoom in a little way. And we can see here, these are the backs here, there, those white hexagonals are the nuts, plastic nuts, which fix the switches, the stop switches, to the acrylic front panel. And uh, each one of those contains a switch, a micro switch and an LED. And the wiring is difficult to discern, but it's there. And uh, if I show you, it's conveyed to the devices through these ribbon cables here, uh, which connect to the, in this case, these are connecting to the encoder because they're the switches and the uh, LEDs connect to the decoder. And I'll show you the encoder and the decoder boards in there in a moment or two. Let's just zoom, zoom out again. Now what you cannot see here uh, is the uh, uh, any part of the OLED electronic labeling system. The reason for that is that uh, this, th these panels, these electro electronic display panels, are right up against the acrylic panel. They lie immediately behind the acrylic panel. So they are actually fixed into a strip board, which I'll show you in a moment. They're fixed into a strip, strip board, which is then anchored in position by this wooden frame, which you can probably see running up and down and along the bottom of the, um, of, of, of the insides of the jam. Let's have a look and you'll see one corner here. If I just arrange for us to zoom in a little bit more. There, you can see that. That, board, that frame uh, anchors the um, electronic display panels into position. Okay, now I'm just going to move our point of view a, a moment so that we will be able to see the encoder and decoder board. It might be difficult for you to discern these two printed circuit boards. The top one here is the MIDI encoder board and it's got 64 inputs and these 64 inputs arrive through these ribbon cables. There are four connectors, um, uh, each one carrying, um, carrying 16 um, uh, ports giving us 64 altogether. And um, these just require, these boards just require a 12 volt power supply which comes in through there. And then they have a MIDI output which is through that cable there, it goes straight in to the, um, uh, the MIDI hub which we looked at a little while ago. And then below that, down here, we've got the MIDI decoder board which has 64 outputs and all those outputs drive the LEDs. So the inputs receive the signals from the switches and the outputs drive the LEDs. Of course, it's a matter of basic principle that you can't simply allow the switch to turn the LD LED on. If you could, life would be much simpler, but you cannot. And that's because you must allow Hauptwerk to control the LEDs because the LEDs in a stop switch can be switched on for more than one reason. Not just because you pressed it to switch that, to bring that stop into action, but what if that stop is part of a registration recorded in a thumb piston? Then you press that thumb piston, which is physically nothing to do with that switch, you press that, foot, that uh, toe piston or thumb piston and you expect the, light, the LED to light. So Halpert must be in control in order to light the LEDs when it wants to, not just because you happen to have pushed one switch. So there's your, your decoder and that's got 64 outputs as I mentioned. This has got two different power inputs. They arrive down here but it's a bit congested so you probably can't see it very well. But there is a 12 volt input which is the same 12 volts as drive the actual electronics and then there's a 5 volt input which actually drives the LEDs. So having had a look at all that, let's see if we see any more by looking at the uh, left hand stop jam 
uh, which we will move over to now because it's possible that some of the things may be a little bit more clearly visible. Looking into the left-hand stop jam as seen from the bench, uh, we're able to see very clearly the uh, column here of um, stop switches and we can see the micro switches there and the LED connections are to the side of the micro switch. So we can see those. We can also see running across the top here the um, uh, strip board which provides the connections between the switch ribbon cable here which goes to the switches and the four ribbon cables which go off to the MIDI encoder board and uh, there is the MIDI encoder board we'll look at that more closely in a moment and then if we just um, take our view down a little way we will be able to see um, at the other end we'll be able to see the cables which come from the LEDs and go into the MIDI decoder board. Uh, once again there's no sign there of the dis displays because the displays are mounted as I mentioned before they're mounted behind um, the, uh, the, the panel there immediately behind the acrylic panel and uh, they're covered up by the, by the um, the wooden uh, base, it, base uh, which uh, sustains the wiring for the switches. Just um, in, in just one moment we will just change our point of view again so that we can see the encoder and decoder boards. Here now we can see the MIDI encoder board which is there and um, we have the uh, output from the encoder board which carries all the switch signals goes through that MIDI uh, cable and connects to our um, MIDI hub uh, on the component shelf um, and you can see the four um, uh, ribbon cables which connect the inputs, the switch inputs to this MIDI encoder board and then below that which we can see here we have the MIDI decoder board, which is there. A uh, bit difficult to see, but it's on there. What we can't see on either of the stop jams, I'm afraid, is the Arduino Due. Um, the Arduino Due has these um, uh, uh, inputs and, uh, uh, and outputs, um, which are for the display system, the text display of each stop switch. Um, but we're not able to see that because it's hidden away, I'm afraid, in that corner. I can just see parts of it, but I'm afraid you can't. It's got all the connections to drive the, um, the, the text into the appropriate uh, electronic label. In examining the, uh, the contents of the stop jams, um, where uh, having removed the backs and looked inside we could see all those switches very clearly but what we couldn't see uh, were the um, uh, uh, the OLED uh, electronic displays which carry the stop text we weren't able to see any of those because they're out of sight well it would have been nice if when we opened the back of the stop jams we might have been able to see inside far enough to be able to see the OLED displays which show the text of the stops um, when the stop, lamp, stop jams uh, uh, note that uh, an organ has been loaded. Uh, but unfortunately we couldn't do that because I would have had to have dismantled the stop jams completely. All we could see were the switches and, the, uh, and their LEDs which control the, the switching of the stop jams rather than the display function to uh, give the stop text. So, because we weren't able to do that, I've got a picture here, which I will put up on the, sc on the screen for you in a moment. And that picture um, is uh, the um, system of uh, OLEDs, uh, which displays that uh, stop text. And it's mounted on a wooden frame, I did explain that to you, which has got the three columns. And uh, in this case, we've actually connected it to the Arduino, uh, and turned it all on so that the um, 
the, the, the uh, self-test text is being shown here um, to uh, let us see um, that each OLED is working correctly. Um, so what we actually have is a long strip board going all the way down there three times for each one for each column okay a long strip board and then at the end of the strip bottom end of the strip board each of them uh, it widens out so that we can actually uh, make some connections to it and we've got a, 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 a 16 way um, insulation displacement connector for a 16 way ribbon cable there and we've got a 40 way um, insulation displacement connector for um, um, uh, for 40 way ribbon cables there and uh, the um, 16 way uh, carry the control signals and data signals uh, to each of these legs of the um, structure and they connect to all the OLEDs and deliver the textual data obviously in digital form and the appropriate um, uh, OLED responds to its own um, message uh, by the way that uh, the electronics works and um, the rest of the connections here are to the many pins on the DUA which ensure that it can all be uh, coordinated. Unfortunately the Arduino DUA is not shown on this picture, uh, that's a pity, uh, but, uh, but there we are. So that is the structure which carries the OLEDs that displays the text for each of the stop stops in the stop jam and that mounts directly behind the black acrylic panel which you saw and which faces the front and that's the face of the uh, stop jam that you see as a player. Thank you very much. I'm now going to uh, go through the process of turning the organ on. I'm going to start by the key switch here. You'll see that the bottom mains rocker switch is now illuminated, which indicates to us it's ready to be turned on. And I'll do that. And whilst we do that, um, I'm going to just um, focus the, um, the camera on the left-hand display. And I'm now turning it on. And you'll see that uh, we have a software version displayed. Um, for a very short time and then we're now instructed to start the PC. Before I do that I'm going to turn the organ off again because I want to show you what happens on the stop jams when we first begin to start the organ. So we're now looking at the stop jams and I'm going to turn the uh, power on to the MIDI and the um, uh, audio devices like I did before and we'll see what happens with the stop jams. Now you'll see that the stop jams have come alive, uh, as indeed did the um, uh, displays. But we're going to just look at this stop jam and see what we've got there. We have a software version notice on the stop jam there. Okay, and also what we've got each stop has a message displayed on it. And that message identifies the, um, uh, the, the label. There we are. It says L41 and L42. And this is applied right the way throughout the stop jam. So if there are any problems with any of the um, display devices or if there are any problems with the uh, other electronics, or indeed without work, we'll be able to see whether it's limited to a group or a single, or the whole lot of the uh, electronic labels. And that um, message 
uh, is, is a kind of useful thing to see, to show us that that part of the organ is working completely satisfactorily. So now we go back here and uh, you'll, we'll read the message on the left hand display and it tells us please start the PC and run Houtwerk. So it's telling us so far so good and to start the PC we just switch the second of the main switches on which I'll do now and the PC will start. As the PC starts we get a message which you can't quite see on the um, on the, the touch screen which is telling us that the PC is is uh, on its way to starting. PC has now started. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, just log in. In fact, I logged in without the use of a keyboard. I um, I logged in using the touchscreen facilities, which you can do uh, if you wish. So we've obeyed part of that instruction. It says, uh, please start the PC and run Houtwork. We haven't actually run Houtwork. You can configure the PC so that Houtwerk will start as the PC starts, but actually I prefer to decide when to, um, to start Houtwerk myself. So I'm going to start Houtwerk now. So Houtwerk is just loading and it won't take many minutes. And you see what we've now got on that uh, display. It says Houtwerk ready. And it displays last queued organ um, before we shut the PC down previously and that last queued organ is number 10 it's the Haverhill uh, Old Independent Chapel now I actually want to play the Hereford so I'm going to load the Hereford and I'll show you what's involved in doing that I've just brought the camera a little bit closer to the um, console so that we can read the uh, little display a bit easier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the um, uh, Hereford, which I actually happen to know is somewhat above number 10. And so we'll just go through, that's 11, 12, 13. And 13 is the Hereford, Hereford 67. So to load the Hereford, what we do is we press the load selected right? and uh, what happens now is the loading message comes up and it reports the percentage as it loads. It won't take very long. You'll notice also that um, the load button is now illuminated. There's the load button and it is now illuminated so it's uh, showing us that the load is taking place and the display is showing us progress as that happens. Um, the same display is appearing on the touch screen, uh, but uh, we, we don't need to refer to that. Now I'm going to move the focus just to the top of the um, stop jam so that you can see how quickly the um, stop jam labels uh, actually were um, loaded up because those stop, stop jam labels now are displaying the details of the um, of the Hereford uh, uh, organ uh, and for example if we need to prove that <coughs> we'll select the tuba stop right and we'll play it <laughs> Reverberation we have there. Okay, let's play a tune. <laughs> 